Thank you. My name is uh, Christian Lemire. I'm the Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security at the IISS, uh, and I'm going to be chairing a session on climate change, HADR, and security in the Asia-Pacific, which is something of a hodgepodge of, uh, of issues, but they are all interrelated. And I've been very pleased, actually, thus far in the uh, dialogue, how strong a focus there has been, um, not just on the maritime, but also on the issue of climate change. Secretary of Defence Hegel uh, mentioned that 80% of the world's large-scale natural disasters happen in the Pacific, and this will be exacerbated by climate change. Uh, and this follows a White House report in May that states that climate change is not a distant problem in the future, but one that is happening now. And that's certainly true in Asia. We see governments from uh, Indonesia to India today developing policies to counteract the effects of El Nino uh, for later on in this year, uh, weather events that are likely to increase in frequency in the future, uh, largely owing to global warming. Um, the Asia-Pacific region is peculiarly vulnerable to climate change because of its extensive coastlines, because of its dependence on food staples such as fish and rice, which are vulnerable to climate change, because of existing transboundary water disputes uh, where water stress may exacerbate those disputes. Similarly, HADR has been a relatively strong theme thus far in, uh, in the dialogue. Uh, Onodera-san stressed Japan's experience in HADR following the 3.11 disaster, uh, Minister Hishamuddin noted the importance of HADR uh, in the MH370 search, and uh, Minister Johnston was even suggesting a regional SAR, uh, SAR exercises to be hosted by Australia um, or to be organised by Australia as part of an HADR uh, theme. HADR responsibilities for militaries uh, may well increase as a natural consequence of climate change and will therefore be a key area for military-to-military -military collaboration in the region, uh, a region that's currently beset by a variety of tensions and frictions, so it could be a, a very important area for increasing cooperation. The question is whether uh, the search for MH370 and the response to Typhoon Haiyan actually exp expose a lie of regional military cooperation in HADR and how easy it is to really bring together the various disparate militaries uh, on this particular role. We have a, a very distinguished and very relevant panel with us today to discuss this issue. Um, we uh, will be starting the proceedings with uh, Lord Tuivakano, who is Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defence from Tonga, who is to my immediate left. Uh, left of him is Dr. Jonathan Coleman, Minister of Defence for New Zealand. Uh, left of him is Dr. Gower Rizvi, who is the International Affairs Advisor to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. And on the far left is Professor Raymond Quillop, who is the Assistant Secretary for Strategic Assessments at DND, the Philippines. So we have Tonga, New Zealand, Bangladesh, and the Philippines represented here, all countries that may well be subject to various effects from climate change. A fair warning, if you are a climate change denier, you are not going to be very popular in this room, and uh, your views probably won't be taken very seriously. Um, the speakers will all start for five to ten minutes uh, of their remarks, and we'll have a fruitful Q&A afterwards. This session is under Chatham House Rules. Uh, and with that, I will give the floor to the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to, to express my sincere thanks to the Prime Minister, Lee Shen Long, our Singaporean host and the International Institute for Strategic Studies for their kind invitation to me and my delegation to attend this important dialogue and equally important to deliver an address on climate change and security in Asia Pacific in this session of the 13th Shingla-La Dialogue. I applaud the IISS long-standing purpose for providing the platform to address the present realities and the most important regional security matters which unfold the vicissitudes of economic and political change in various countries. In this session, it is my great honor to address you on a topic that is none other than becoming far too familiar and close to the heart of those within the Pacific region than anywhere else in the world. For those of you that do not understand this, we sit right inside the ring of fire. So you can expect we have earthquake every week of the year. Climate change is a number one threat to the security of our region, our survival and our people. 
When I think about the array of global threats that if affects the security of the Asia-Pacific region, I think about food security and poverty, terrorism, natural disasters, including tsunami, tropical cyclones, and earthquakes, the manifestation of climate change that can destroy, even wipe out our small countries from the face of the earth, if we are to identify mitigation measures and implement them immediately. Some of you would know of Tonga's contribution to peace and security through our participation in mission in Iraq, Afghanistan, Solomon Island, and Pokenville over many years. Indeed, our last contingents of 55 troops returned to Tonga from Afghanistan just a week ago. In this way, Tonga is doing what we can indonesially, but climate change poses threats that are beyond our own capacity to respond. On January 11th, 2014, a Category 5 cyclone struck the Hapai island of Tonga, damaging more than 80% of all residential houses. This has provided an economic and social cost of more than 10% of the U.S. 400 million overall production of the country GDP. The residents are by is still living in despair. But the question to us is this natural calamity is going to end. <clears throat> the answer is no, and it may even get worse. I guess what I'm trying to, to say that it is now not just an environmental issue or an economic issue. Today, many developed and emerging powers have come to recognize that climate change is also a fundamental security issue that affects life as we know it on the planet itself. And it demands urgent attention from all of us. World leaders of the 21st century have come to recognize that climate change can impact national security, ranging from rising sea levels to severe droughts to the melting of the polar gaps, to more frequent and devastating natural disasters that raise demand for humanitarian assistance and disasters relief, but more importantly, to recognizing their causes and implementing solution for their minimization and eventually reversing the trend, it is never too late. Many research and publications have identify that small Pacific Islands as being among the most vulnerable countries of the world to the adverse impacts of climate change. And because of their unique geophysical features, social, economic, and unique cultural characteristics are particularly vulnerable to the effects of global warming, including more frequent and intense natural disasters such as cyclone, floods, and land drought, as has recently been experienced in many countries of the region, such as had happened in Tonga. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, from a South Pacific perspective, I want to end this with this statement, climate change has three main dimensions. First, the causes of it. Secondly, the impact of it. Thirdly, though we are doing a lot to help ourselves, but in this case, against this threat, we need help from the world community. I guess I and my Pacific neighbors cannot say much on the causes of climate change. Our only wish is that we must work together immediately to reduce and even reverse it. It is a big ask but it must be done. It is not too late. Until we can arrest the causes of climate change, it is here to stay, and we must prepare, we must be prepared for them. Preparation, however, is not something we do one hour before the risk strikes. It is something we must all plan for long before the risk strikes. 
Preparation needs resources. Resources, at most time, we do not have. We must therefore continue to work collaboratively and in partnerships. It is the only way to manage and reduce the risk of this danger. Ladies and gentlemen, Marlo Apito, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, particularly for delivering the stark warning that climate change could in fact destroy or wipe out the small countries and the uh, lack of capacity in some of those small countries to be able to cope with the very grave effects. Um, I just wanted to correct myself very briefly because like a bad chairperson, I hadn't actually read the notes in front of me. This session is in fact on the record, so in case any of you are thinking of saying something offensive, maybe rethink that now. Um, I will now pass the uh, floor over to Dr. Coleman, who I assume will not be saying anything offensive. Thank you very much, Christian. I want to say uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, speaking here on behalf of New Zealand at this session on climate change, uh, HADR, and security in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, look, regardless of what uh, you think of the causation of climate change, uh, this is not a debate or a discussion about climate change science per se, but I think the evidence is very compelling that this is a real phenomenon and uh, you can listen to the statistics. Um, global sea levels rose 17 centimetres in the last century, and the rate of rise has been double that in the first decade of this century. I had the privilege of going down to Antarctica in February to look at uh, New Zealand's research state, uh, station there at uh, Scott Base, uh, which is on the edge of the Ross Sea ice shelf. And... Uh, you can look at the statistics, but a practical uh, illustration, I think, uh, is probably far more effective. So each year there outside Scott Base, the sea freezes for a distance of kilometre after kilometre, like you know, 20 kilometres out from the edge of the base, and we are able to land uh, right there outside the base with the Ski Hercules aircraft. This year, for the first time in 20 years, uh, the sea did not freeze o over, and so instead of Ski Hercules outside the base, uh, we had the sight of orcas, so killer whales, playing uh, right down at the edge of our front door there, which for me was a pretty stark illustration. Also flying into Antarctica, uh, an amazing experience in itself. Uh, I was able to witness uh, icebergs 10 kilometres long and 300 metres high, and that's just what you can see above the surface. And so that, for me... Uh, really paints the picture of a planet that is warming at an alarming rate. And there's really three uh, points I want to make. The first is that in terms of security threats, climate change is a risk multiplier, and I'll come back to that. The second is that uh, defence forces across the region need to be prepared, and we've seen some excellent examples of that, uh, which Lord Tuivacano uh, spoke to, but you know, uh, Typhoon Haiyan, the, the search for MH370, obviously not a climate change issue, but a humanitarian assistance uh, issue. And then the third point is when you look at uh, this Shangri La dialogue, uh, it strikes me that one of the things we're striving for is finding points of engagement across the region. How can we find areas of common interest? Uh, where people can put aside differences they may hold around territorial disputes, traditional animosities, and focus on uh, problems that matter, both immediate and long term. And the response to climate change uh, and HADR in our region, I think, is one of those. So that is an opportunity, I think, for engagement uh, between people who may not be natural partners. And as I say, we have seen examples of that. So going back to the first of those three points, when you talk about climate change as a risk multiplier, you know, there's a lot of non-traditional security threats across our region. In some parts of uh, the South Pacific, uh, so thinking more in New Zealand's own backyard, you know, there are issues uh, related to governance, uh, there's economic development issues, there's uh, pressure on resources, natural resources, and of course we have now this pressure of climate change, extreme weather events. So what it means overall is you throw all the elements in the mix uh, for security challenges, you put climate change and humanitarian issues uh, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief issues on top of that, and that can 
accelerate the pace of instability. And if you look at across the region, uh, I was just reading, there's still uh, hundreds of thousands homeless in the Philippines as a result of Typhoon Haiyan. You know, massive pressure for governments there. Uh, floods in Tonga. I'm sure your government has uh, had a massive challenge dealing with that. So it's another thing that adds to the mix of instability in the region. And that leads to my third point. Defence forces need to be prepared. We did a white paper, completed a white paper in 2010, looking at uh, what would be the demands placed on the New Zealand Defence Force uh, over the coming decade. And we found actually that 30% of our resources in New Zealand's Defence Force are actually committed to HADR work. A lot of that is deploying into the Southwest Pacific. So we have to be ready for these events that occur on our back doorstep. And uh, that is certainly something which we have done historically. But we actually found in 2010 and the early part of 2011, we had our own challenge in New Zealand with the Christchurch earthquakes. Uh, and they were massive events. So the fourth largest just insurance events in history and events which are going to cost 20% of our GDP to fix, which is you know a massive impost for any country. So we have, out of that white paper, and it was quite fortuitous when you look at what subsequently happened in New Zealand, we are looking at how we can figure our defence force to respond to issues across the region. And we are focusing on the development of a joint amphibious task force which can deploy easily into our backyard, the Pacific, um, supported with strategic airlift, the ability to deploy uh, humanitarian aid and troops very quickly uh, with the needed supplies into um, the environment that you find in the Southwest Pacific. So I think that's something for all nations to consider. Uh, we think of traditional defence settings uh, they, that now, I believe, in our region has to um, include the ability to respond to uh, climate change emergencies, if you like, and carry out HADR work. And then that third uh, point is around um, opportunities for engagement. Uh, everyone across the region wants to uh, get to know each other better. It's not just traditional partners. But we in New Zealand are very keen to work uh, more closely with our friends in China. Um, we've always known the Australians extremely well. Uh, we've had a traditional history, of course, with the US and our good friends, of course, in the Pacific Islands. Um, but a key to security in the long term is developing that interoperability and developing that trust. And I think last year, Chuck Hagel said, you can't surge trust. Well, HADR exercises and uh, joint responses is a way to build that trust that I believe uh, strengthens the security of the region. So on that note, last year, for the first time ever, we held a quadrilateral um, exercise in New Zealand involving China, New Zealand, Australia, and the US. Uh, the first time we'd had PLA troops exercising in New Zealand, and that was a scenario that took the lessons from the Christchurch earthquakes and sought to apply those uh, in possible uh, scenarios across the Asia-Pacific region. Um, I think the way ahead, actually, across the Asia-Pacific would be looking to engage a wider set of countries in exercises like Pacific Partnership, which is an HADR capacity building exercise undertaken every year across the Asia-Pacific. Uh, traditionally includes New Zealand, Australia, uh, the US, uh, Japan is involved, uh, a number of other partners. Uh, but potentially that is a way to bring people into uh, an area of common um, interest. So. No question that climate change and HADR are going to be uh, big preoccupations in the future in our region. Uh, climate change is a risk multiplier and brings to a head security problems much more rapidly. We've got to configure our defence forces accordingly. And the final point is I believe that collaboration in this field creates a great opportunity for building trust and cooperation and actually strengthens the wider security settings across the Asia-Pacific. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think a key point there is that climate change is not necessarily a direct co cause of uh, conflict in itself, but it certainly uh, can weaken governance and increase stress on social and economic stability. Um, and preparations for those effects are not always in place, but they can be very useful uh, in trust building in themselves. Um, we will now turn to uh, Dr. Rizvi. 
Thank you, Christian. First, uh, uh, let me th uh, thank uh, IISS for giving me the opportunity to uh, present uh, Bangladesh's perspective on security threats posed by the climate change. Uh, while I was listening to the Prime Minister of Tonga, I was reminded uh, of the words of wisdom from another uh, head of uh, uh, a state in, in the Pacific Island uh, who had said that uh, uh, had said when it comes to climate change and security, no country is an island. And uh, his his remark really brought into sharp focus what uh, nothing else could have done. His island country, with about a hundred thousand people. Uh, are in real danger of going underwater even before the end of the century. Such is the threat. And it was, in again, uh, we in Bangladesh especially realize uh, these, these danger. For us, the dangers arising from climate change is real, it is imminent, and what is worse, it is already beginning to, uh, some of the uh, uh, effects are already beginning to manifest uh, itself. At the uh, 67th uh, UN General Assembly, our Prime Minister had said, one meter uh, level, uh, increase in the water level would displace 30% of Bangladesh's population, which is ar around uh, uh, 40 or so million of people. And that you can begin to imagine what a serious problem that we are uh, faced uh, with. These two comments pretty much encapsulate the harsh narrative and the onslaught of climate change on the entire spectrum of low-lying subtropical countries of Asia and the Pacific region, from Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal up to the Cook Islands in the South Pacific Ocean. According to the UNDP's 2012 Asia-Pacific Human Development Report, the Asia-Pacific region, uh, the home of two-thirds of world's poor and half of the world's interest rate conflict, is more likely and more vulnerable than any other region of the world to be faced with humanitarian and non-traditional threats as a direct consequence of climate change. Higher temperature, increased flooding and drought, glacial melts and earthquake are likely to damage or destroy agriculture, forest, cropping, fisheries, water supply, and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, if you look again at the map of Asia Pacific, some 70% of the world's low-lying coastlines are in this, in this uh, region and are likely to be directly impacted by climate-driven sea level rise. Right at the moment, I saw one estimate which says that $85 billion a year, uh, uh, this uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, increase in temperature is causing in terms of economic cost. And this will easily rise to over $500 billion by 2030. This would create a grave social and economic insecurity as well as ethnic conflicts and inequality related social tensions. Natural disasters, we know, increased uh, extreme weather conditions and rising sea levels will invariably increase resource scarcity and hunger, related uh, deaths of hundreds of millions of most vulnerable and unsecured people, displacement of large number of peoples, and creating a uh, a, a humanitarian crisis of unprecedented uh, 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 expanse and calamity. All these are likely to act as threat multipliers to conflict in areas already facing development and security challenges. Climate change therefore represents the largest and the most significant global threat to peace and security and its impact are set to fall disproportionately on the world's most vulnerable populations in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. 
the links between climate change and security have been well recognized at the ASEAN Regional Forum and other regional security fora, the UN General Assembly, the UN Security Council. And yet, the issue remains peripheral to national, regional, and international peace and security architecture and strategies. We in Bangladesh have brought the climate change and security discourse at the heart of Shangri-La Dialogue. And we, as we are in the front line of climate uh, change and working to mitigate threats to our national security. We have developed a comprehensive national adaptation and mitigation plan, and we have also adopted a National Disaster Management Act and strategy, and in the process uh, built up very considerable human capacity for dealing with uh, 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 natural catastrophe as in the past such catastrophe has been a regular part of our life. More recently, we have created a National Climate Change Trust Fund from our own resources to invest in more than 200 adaptation and mitiga uh, mitigation projects. And we also have a Climate Change Resilient Fund with assistance from a number of our developing partners. As immediate past chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, comprising mostly of Asia and Pacific countries, Bangladesh has been a staunch advocate and a voice for regional cooperation in Asia Pacific for addressing uh, climatically introduced vulnerability and secure insecurity at the ARF here at Shangri-La, as I said at the, earlier at the UN and in other various forums. And hence, I think there can be very uh, few forums as appropriate as uh, this dialogue here to share what uh, the threats posed uh, by climate change to developing countries, to Bangladesh uh, in particular, and to the uh, globe uh, uh, at large. While the dangers, and as the chair started, started the session by saying, this room uh, is no place for uh, uh, climate change doubters, and I'm glad it isn't, because as I said earlier, for us, this is not something theoretical. This is not something which is going to happen in the future. It is already beginning uh, to happen. And while developing countries, uh, I'll just end by saying, while developing countries have uh, contributed least to global warming, sadly, they're amongst the worst victims of this uh, uh, phenomenon. These countries are not only vulnerable, but also least able to fend for themselves. Therefore, I agree with the New Zealand uh, minister uh, that this is one area where we need to work, all of us need to work together. And as I said early, uh, earlier, that while I'm trying to speak mainly from the perspective of a, Bang uh, of a of Bangladesh and developing society, I think it will be useful for us to be reminded that the phenomenon is not confined to developing countries only. In fact, it is a, a concern of humanity at large, rich and the poor alone. Uh, often in the, in the discussion, in the debate, uh, people in the West forget that the consequences of this global uh, warming, one of the consequences of this global warming uh, is, and it could lead to involuntary mi mass migration, the sort of migration that the world has never seen before. And that should be a useful reminder to all of us that we need to work together. It is not a phenomenon in somebody else's backyard, but in everybody's home ground. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Rizvi, um, for a very lucid uh, presentation. I think very important there to bring in the uh, alarming and somewhat depressing statistics that you uh, used to um, explain the sheer scale that we may face uh, in the challenge of climate change, including the potential movement of uh, 40 million people in Bangladesh through involuntary mass migration with a very predictable one-metre rise in sea level. Um, 
We will now move to our final speaker, uh, who is from the Philippines, Professor Quillop. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, personally, uh, I find this uh, session uh, very uh, uh, useful, and uh, I'm very happy to note uh, that uh, we're now seeing actually a convergence of two important concepts that we have been uh, grappling with for the past uh, several years now, climate change and HADR. For quite some time, uh, these two uh, issues have been treated separately. HADR is just responding to disasters which could come about whether or not there is climate change. And there was, my own sense is that there was a, a, a relatively uh, low level of appreciation for the effects of climate change. But now we are practically discussing these two issues together, perhaps because of the fact that a lot of the necessity for responding is now being brought about by a, a, by a climate change. So before I proceed further in sharing my, my own personal thoughts, uh, allow me to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts, uh, issue, uh, perspectives, and, and what I think uh, are, are some lessons that uh, we could all learn from the experiences of the Philippines with a lot of uh, natural calamities. Uh, statistics would say that we uh, experience around 20 typhoons every year, but the truth of the matter uh, is that uh, we usually go beyond the alphabet, as the Secretary of National Defense would, would often uh, say. Uh, secondly, let me also convey uh, from the Philippine perspective the appreciation that we have for the international community for the contributions and assistance that have been given by the world uh, when we were struck by Haiyan. Uh, regional response, uh, for that matter, uh, uh, figures would indicate that more or less we had 30 military, less than 30 military contingents, around 130 aircraft and 25 vessels participating in the rescue, relief, and rehabilitation effort. And could you imagine that uh, enormous military capability that was present at that time in responding to Haiyan? So much so that uh, my first main point, or the first main point that I would like to put forward is uh, the, the challenge for the Philippines was not only how to respond to Haiyan, but actually how to manage the volume and magnitude of assistance that came in. And, and, and we are very, very appreciative of that. Of course, it's a lot better to be talking of how to manage such kind and magnitude of assistance rather than to be talking about not having any assistance at all. And, and, and we, we were really touched because all over the world, People from ordinary citizens to governments practically took their own individual efforts to contribute. And, and governments have been telling us their ordinary citizens uh, took the initiative to pull together uh, so many or so much fun for that matter. Now, the, the second point that I would like to emphasize is that uh, we all talk of climate change, mitigation, adaptation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But I think the crux of the matter is actually on the response side. F previously, response was the focus, and there came about a refocus on mitigation, prevention, preparedness, with the argument that if we are prepared well enough, if we are able to mitigate the effects of disasters, then the necessity of responding when disaster comes gets minimized. But I believe personally that at the end of the day, no matter how you prepare, no matter how you try to mitigate the possible effects of disasters, disasters will always strike. And when they strike, governments will be judged by their people, by their ability to respond quickly and effectively. And that applies to all governments. And I'm talking from the Philippine experience uh, because for us in the Philippines, we could humbly say that we have a relatively comprehensive approach to disasters, so much so that we have divided our approach in dealing with disasters into several aspects, prevention and mitigation, preparedness, response, and rehabilitation, with individual government agencies being tasked to practically address these various aspects. But again, as I said, at the end of the day, it's a matter of how the government in its entirety practically is able to respond effectively and efficiently when a disaster strikes. And 
And of course, without discounting the fact that if we're able to prepare well, then the necessity for response uh, uh, gets decreased. So what we're trying to do now in the Philippines and here from a perspective of, of the Department of National Defense, we're trying to uh, sort of divide the labor between two agencies that we have actually that, that uh, are concerned with dealing with disasters. The Office of Civil Defense and our Armed Forces of the Philippines, which is our defense force. Now, our Office of Civil Defense is primarily tasked with prevention, mitigation, and preparedness aspects. Whereas our defense forces, for various reasons, is being tasked to focus on, on, on response. But needless to say, both of them practically are very much involved in, 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 in or, or working collaboratively with each other. So much so that the OCD or our Office of Civil Defense, although also does some response functions, and at the same time, our uh, armed forces is also involved in other aspects of prevention, mitigation, and preparedness, including rehabilitation, especially when it comes to rebuilding or reconstructing damaged infrastructure. So, uh, having said that, the next, the next point that I would like to emphasize would be the need really to enhance the capacity to respond. So, to, to respond, sorry. Uh, and, and when we talk of enhancing the capacity of defense forces to respond, uh, the usefulness of the military exercises that we do uh, comes into the picture. And we are glad that in this Asia Pacific region alone, there are a lot of exercises that we do. We could talk of the ASEAN-led exercises, and you have, for example, the ARF uh, disaster relief exercise, the ASEAN humanitarian exercise, uh, not to mention the various individually, nationally-led and organized exercises all over the place. So much so that sometimes we ask ourselves, aren't we doing so much or so many of these exercises? So much so that our defense forces no longer do anything across the year, but to be involved in exercises, which now brings me to the issue of having to really rationalize all these things, so much so that our defense forces do not get too embroiled in doing exercises, such that when a real disaster strikes, they could not respond because the resources have been utilized in doing all these exercises. But this is not to discount also the, the utility of these exercises. People after Haiyan have, some people will have, have criticized um, uh, uh, the region, for example, ASEAN, for not having or not having had a coordinated regional response to Haiyan. And they would say, uh, you have undertaken all these exercises. Why is it that when high end strike, it was still pandemonium? We could practically reverse the argument and say, without those exercises, then things could have been worse. Because with these exercises, at least our military forces got an idea of working together and how to respond to a disaster. Uh, no, is that an indication that I should stop talking? No. So... Uh, so true enough, the response may not have been ideal, as some people would have wanted it, but we're talking here of disaster. And, and no matter how we prepare, and this is something that we all learn, no matter how we, pray, we prepare for responding to a disaster, when a disaster strikes, it is really disastrous. So uh, the key, therefore, I think, from a personal point of view, is striking a balance between being able to do all these exercises and at the same time still having enough resources, capacity, and people to do the actual response. Now, the next point that I would like to emphasize, and this is something that we have also learned, is really the need to and the imperative to work with various sectors, civilian agencies and other actors within and outside our respective governments and local government units too. And the, uh, the irony is sometimes local governments which are expected to be the first responders together with our defense forces actually could not really make the necessary response because they themselves have been uh, practically a uh, uh, victim. Uh, next key point that I would like to, to drive home is that uh, we all want a regional response. We all want, for example, ASEAN, for that matter, to be responding as a unit, as a collective body. But let's face the reality. When a disaster strikes, the efforts will come mostly from individual, unilateral efforts of states. Not because they want to do things on their own, 
unmindful of the existence of a regional body, but simply because they want to help as soon uh, as possible. Let me end with a with, uh, couple of points, and this is to say that uh, we actually have frameworks for responding to disasters. Uh, there are already frameworks that exist out there. In fact, if you do a survey of ASEAN-led efforts, agreements, etc., etc., there are existing frameworks, and yet people keep talking of the need to come up with a legal parameter, etc., etc., for responding to disasters. Be why is this the case? Simply because there are certain situations wherein forces could not make a, an immediate response because there are certain legal constraints for these forces to go into the territory of other states. My own personal view is that this is a disaster, and so in times of disaster, why couldn't we just relax all those legal requirements and let's talk about those legal requirements after we have responded adequately to disasters. And so this is the context where there are now proposals right, right, right at the very moment to come up with a regional sort of a standard operating procedure or even a regional template that could easily be adopted by countries when a disaster strikes so that foreign forces could readily and easily come into, go into the territory of a country for them to do the necessary response. But my own personal take, as I said, let's relax those re legal requirements, requirements for diplomatic clearances, et cetera, et cetera, and let forces wanting to help come into the picture. And so let me end with those notes, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you also for bringing into discussion the various barriers or hindrances that uh, currently exist to uh, closer collaboration on HADR, which I think is a much fuller discussion that could be had. Um, and the important point made that uh, no matter how much you prepare and attempt to mitigate the effects of climate change, you will almost always likely need some form of response, and that will almost always fall on the military, although other agencies might be involved. Um, we have nearly 45 minutes left in this session um, in which I would like to have a very free-flowing and fruitful discussion uh, with questions from the floor. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your name board and place it vertically, um, and I will then put you on my list and call upon you in turn. Um, and we'll start with uh, Ms. Malik. Thank you, sir. Thank you, for, uh, thank you panel, for such an insightful and uh, wonderful uh, set of presentations. Um, while I was listening to Secretary Culip, I uh, uh, was actually uh, looking for a model from ASEAN, because in South Asia, coming from Pakistan, we always quote ASEAN as the successful model, uh, which, which has all the cooperative pluses to it. And I was slightly miffed when you said that it's an individual effort rather than a block effort. So my question uh, primarily is to Mr. Gohariswi, who was the architect of SARC, so to speak, Sir, if ASEAN cannot come up with a regional response to these problems, which are humanitarian disasters, what can and what will South Asia do, especially when it comes to bringing down the natural barriers? And each of the South Asian countries are haunted by their own versions of climate challenges. Uh, can SARC be made viable? Or do we need to go for something else, which again will end up producing the same responses or the same problems that SARC is faced with? What is your answer to, for the regional response to this problem? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one or two more. Uh, Mr. Yoshizaki from Japan. Thank you, Chair. I'm Yoshizaki from Japan, and uh, let me share with you some of the key findings of the March 11th, where when we accepted the falling um, the military assistance and the, and the humanitarian assistance. Japan has a long history of being a recipient but uh, the, 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 uh, providing the humanitarian assistance. But that was the first time to be recipient. The most critical obstacle was the legal one, as Professor Kinlop uh, the, uh, underlined. So my question goes to you is that, uh, do you think that the legal rearrangement, which paved the way for much more effective um, the receiving the human assistance, will change the concept of the sacred sovereignty. If the government, recipient government, is sincere in having a good governance in mind, then we should relax the too much restriction having the foreign system. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, Cho Kong from Shell. Thanks, Christian. Uh, I have two points to make. Uh, first, uh, we began with uh, Prime Minister Trivakano's uh, division of the problem uh, into cause, effect, and the help needed for that effect. And the focus was very much on the latter two, effect and help. Um, and then we heard uh, Secretary Quillop uh, saying that, well, there has been criticism, but uh, within the region, there are frameworks in place, and the militaries are aware of the need to work together. And it would be good to know what more can be done in this area uh, region-wide. But having said that, I still would argue that uh, uh, we do need to see an international effort to deal with the causes, because if you don't deal with the causes, the problems just get worse. You're, you're putting a Band-Aid solution uh, on, the, on, the, on the sore. You're not actually dealing with the cause of the sore or the wound. And so my, the thought in my mind is, just as you're talking about a regional effort to deal with the, uh, deal with the effects, could the region also take a lead uh, in, and the region, I define that broadly as, uh, you know, the region covered by the Shangri-La Dialogue, so developed countries as well as developing, large countries as well as small countries, uh, can the region take a lead in dealing with the causes of climate change? Uh, and of course, and I know you said this uh, not entirely seriously, I take it, Christian, but uh, can, in dealing with the causes, we do have to deal with the climate deniers. Um, uh, and to recognize that uh, it's very difficult to make the case, given that you might have any one natural disaster, and how do you establish a conclusive proof that that is due largely or solely to global warming, let's say. So that's my first point. Second point is uh, most of the discussion I've heard uh, from our four presenters has been on climate volatility and sea level rise and the security implications that follow on from that. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, we need also to be aware that, uh, and I'm sure many of us are, that uh, these are inextricably linked also to food production and to the availability of fresh water. Uh, these are more slow-burning issues perhaps than uh, the immediate effect of climate volatility but they pose just as large, if not even larger, security concerns in the medium to longer term for the countries of this region. Uh, and it would be good to know uh, what positions countries are taking uh, on these big questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll return to the panel, but we have uh, some very rich issues there. Um, the issue of the difficulties that SARC may face as a regional agency, which I think could be expanded to ASEAN, uh, legal arrangements and concepts of sovereignty, and then uh, from Cho, international efforts to deal with the causes and deniers and also food and water security. Um, we'll go in revo reverse order from the panel, so we'll start uh, with Professor Quillop. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me uh, just start off with a clarification. Uh, uh, we're not saying that ASEAN or there is no collective response from ASEAN. In fact, there is a lot of uh, ASEAN-led efforts on how to respond to disasters uh, collectively, and that may perhaps explain why uh, the ASEAN has also been touted as a very successful regional organization. What I'm trying to drive at is beyond or beneath this regional effort actually is the individual efforts of ASEAN members, so much so that we don't have to wait for the regional response to kick in before individual nations could make their contribution. Uh, so that's, that's a very important point. Uh, relaxation of, of, of legal requirements. Uh, some countries that are very much sensitive to this uh, still absolute notion of sovereignty would, may find it very difficult to really relax those things. Some countries that are relatively more comfortable with their sense of being sovereign may find it easier to relax those legal requirements. And I think the middle ground would be to come up, as proposed by a lot of other sectors, to come up with a, 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 a template, so to speak, so, uh, so, so to speak, that could easily be adopted by, by um, countries when a disaster strikes so that assistance and response could come in. But my point is, rather than, uh, even if you have already this uh, sort of templates for that matter, we don't have to have those templates signed and formalized before action could be undertaken by countries. So I think that would be a very good middle ground. Uh, but but the, the truth of the matter is just coming up with these regional arrangements, these regional templates, 
standard SOPs for that matter. I don't know, but it's uh, it really takes some time, especially when you're working with uh, within governments, uh, across governments, interagencies, stuff like that. Uh, third question. Oh, the, the idea that we need to deal with these other issues, I definitely agree. We need to look at the issues beyond climate change because for all we know, climate change is likewise an effect of these particular issues. But uh, uh, that those issues should be taken at the broader national level when we're talking of, of, of uh, the role of defense forces. I, I think for uh, 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 pragmatic uh, considerations, we have to deal with, with, with climate change and disaster response at this point in time. But in, in our doing of longer term planning, so to speak, we should be able to factor this in. And that is the reason why, for example, in the case of the Philippines, uh, food and water security is part and parcel of the uh, security concerns that we have identified, although we are putting them in what we call the secondary set of issues that are emerging, which could very well take center stage in five or ten years or even three years from now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rizvi. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, the question that was posed to me was how uh, in a region where there is so much suspicion and so much uh, barriers to cooperation, how uh, the countries might work together uh, it has been difficult, but uh, it hasn't, uh, even though S South Asia may not have worked uh, as a region in helping each other or assisting each other, but examples of uh, uh, such cooperation abounds. Uh, when there was a disaster in uh, uh, Nepal, India came to its assistance very quickly. Likewise, in Myanmar, Bangladesh was very quick because all these countries have great experience. But what is very uh, interesting uh, and important to realize is how much capacity the countries themselves have. I mean, in fact, Pakistan, uh, where you come from, Salma, uh, has uh, shown itself how much, how able it is. Uh, d during the Kashmir uh, earthquake, one of the least accessible regions uh, probably anywhere in the world where uh, some of uh, where the transport infrastructure uh, hardly existed and i think uh, pakistan the way the pakistan armed forces and pakistan uh, other services uh, 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 dealt with the disaster relief was quite uh, uh, remarkable and within a year if I, my memory is correct when the big floods happen, the same thing happened. So while uh, uh, each of the South Asian countries has developed very considerable uh, national uh, capacity, uh, there remains a problem because of the deep suspicions. But here I think in these matters, the real uh, cooperation happens at a sub-regional level uh, where you have uh, shared boundaries where you uh, where uh, sometimes uh, areas are more accessible from the other side of the boundary for instance uh, in northeast uh, uh, assam is more accessible from bangladesh than from uh, parts of india so i think those are the sort of arrangements one needs to be think think of but i still think and i want to go back and i think uh, uh, somebody uh, from there raised this point is important while uh, co regional cooperation in responding to crisis is important and whatever can be done needs to be done, but it is far more important and internationally, it is uh, far more important and far more possible to collaborate uh, uh, to remove the causes of uh, global change that lead to it. That's where I think the cooperation is really vital. Uh, no country uh, can deal on its own. As we have already seen, those countries which are suffering uh, from it are not uh, causing the problem. And therefore, I really, really believe that without international cooperation, uh, we will not be able to address the fundamental cause, and that is where the real focus should be. So on the issue of, you know, could more be done across the region uh, to tackle this problem? I mean, 
I think in terms of developed economies during the GFC, uh, things like emissions trading schemes and tackling this problem went on to the back burner. But now as economies improve, you know, people realise that uh, not only is this a real phenomenon that's not going away, but uh, there's going to be an economic imperative to actually do something about it. And if you look at a country, my own country, uh, you know, we have uh, honoured our commitments under the UN uh, framework, so that's to reduce our emissions um, by 5% below 1990 levels by 2020. But I think it's up to each country to look at their own emissions profile and to take action accordingly. So we're a small trading nation. Uh, we're very reliant on selling our produce overseas. And uh, if we are to successfully sell into markets where this is an issue, I mean, we will have to have our house in order, otherwise we might have our lunch cut by the competition. So we've been very instrumental in driving the Global Research Alliance, which has looked at uh, how we can produce food in ways that results in fewer emissions overall. And that's a big issue uh, in New Zealand with, as I say, 50% of our total emissions being uh, produced by agriculture. Can other countries do more? Well, it's not for uh, me to critique others' uh, policy in this area, but uh, I think it's you know beholden on us all to actually look at our policy settings, get the balance between. You know, there's a lot of pressures, obviously. There's uh, internal domestic pressures. There's uh, you know global expectations, and there's what's feasible and achievable. Um, but yep, I agree with you. I think uh, more potentially could be done across the region and it bears looking at on a regular basis. Thank you, Lord Tuvakane. Uh, thank you, Chair um, <clears throat> I will try to to speak on the, from a smaller um, countries in the Pacific. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions I think it was it's very important, the courses, of course, but at the same time, we, in the small countries, we cannot uh, solve the problem or tell other countries how to, to stop emissions and other things. We have um, a, the Tonga Energy Roadmap, so we're looking at renewable. I maybe mean, use this as an example, maybe this is a model it can be used by smaller um, <clears throat> developing countries, and something that went right up the UN and has been endorsed by the Secretary General, and now we have the, um, the sustainable energy for all. And if the international, in that sense, I think it was by Korea, and the international, that level, has to recognize the causes, they are the ones who should be active. But for us, we are, we are looking um, how to, to, to solve some of this. Um, <clears throat> the Tonga Energy Roadmap, it was formed, but it, it changed the whole eight paradigm. We are no longer, we just come to have a bilateral one-to-one, -one, but where all the developing partners come together and they put their resources in, because it's in a, a renewable, it's a big, issue in the Pacific, and climate change, perhaps can adopt the same model where we can all work together, not only within the region, but can take it up another step to the international fora, and eventually to the United Nations. And I think because um, that will solve a lot of, of problems. Now, just for, for, for example, since we have the term, we have over 100 million projects worth of projects by different countries putting up solar. So in this um, um, example, and I think climate change can be something that for the, for the smaller um, countries, developing countries, they can adopt some such a model where the government has to involve all the lining ministries in your own country can, can, can come together and make everything trans transparent so that because one of the things with bilateral they have to trust that you're using your money for what is you're supposed to be doing to help with solve um, or whatever if you're putting up for climate change or risk disaster management so 
and this is one of the things, perhaps you can probably answer some, some of the, the questions from um, Korea, or, but also with the smaller states. And this, um, and I think something that can be learned from the. For those that um, want to know more, you can talk to me later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take another round of questions. Um, Wei Lai from China. Thanks. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to say a few words uh, uh, on, uh, on the issues that you raised on water security. And I totally agree and believe that the water security is the number one uh, non-traditional security in China uh, as to climate change. And uh, China would like to uh, put more and more capital and investment in water-related deals and uh, water-related projects. And in this kind of uh, area, China seeks uh, uh, solid partnership and uh, trust with the United States. And even uh, China and the United States will play a very important uh, leadership role in the aging. And uh, we hope to seek and have more uh, cooperation with uh, other Asian countries in the Pacific as to security cooperation. And uh, number two, um, as to the natural disaster or some other disaster uh, related issues, uh, I would like to have some experts' uh, opinion on some accident like a Malaysia airline uh, accident because uh, uh, China, China has lost uh, over uh, 100 people. Uh, and uh, so far, we do not have sufficient intelligence on this. We don't know what's going on, and uh, what should we learn from this kind of uh, natural disasters or whatever disasters. And it seems to the public that we do not have sufficient intelligence sharing channel or intelligence uh, pr um, uh, sharing uh, uh, mechanism to uh, take to take such kind of risk. So I would like to have your opinions on that, how to promote our uh, solid cooperation. All the government have, have the responsibility to give the public an uh, answer. Thanks. Thank you. From the European Union, Reinhard uh, Bittekoffer. Thank you, Chair. I do agree with what um, New Zealand Minister of Defense said about issues of climate change providing some kind of an opportunity to create some common cause and, and sort of serve beyond the issue per se as a trust building uh, area of cooperation. Now the question is, and I really don't know, is there any regular platform for strategic analysis and cooperation in that regard in this region? And second question, um, as you all know, next year in Paris, at the end of the year, there will be the hopefully successful, nobody knows, uh, Paris uh, Conference of Parties. Uh, everybody expects if we don't deliver any positive result there, it will be very hard to come up with uh, even part, so part solutions by 2020. So, so this, this will be a decisive event. Now the question that I have is, uh, to what degree are your countries sort of forming alliances to organize political initiatives in the lead up to that event? Uh, are you forming alliances within the region, beyond the region? Is this a major topic in the conversations with the major powers? Is there an evolving coalition of the willing? I mean, it's, I know it's about politics that I'm asking, not about policy. I think it will be easier to agree on policy, but without politics, there will not be policy. So my question is, is there anything cooking that might have a major impact on what we will see in Paris? Thank you. Uh, Professor Nee from the WLS, geographically from Brazil, uh, Antonio Sampaio, perhaps with a Latin American view. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, my view kind of goes away from the focus of the Asia-Pacific of the session, but uh, I was going to ask also about the um, how, how do you see the global search for, for solutions 
uh, if it's still after the pessimism of the Rio Plus 20 conference, if this is still being discussed as being a, 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 the primary route to pursue solutions, or rather uh, the discussion about regional solutions, cities coming together, the role of business, if this is perhaps a more uh, viable solution for the near term, given the urgency that, for example, Tonga has for solutions on the short term. And also, uh, and then I come more to my region, uh, the role of leadership, um, especially regarding the emerging powers, uh, I'm talking about Brazil, that um, uh, kind of uh, propose themselves to be the leaders. So how is that working? Do they, did they bring anything new to the discussion or new to the, um, to the search for solutions? Do they play a useful role? Thank you. Uh, we'll return to the panel uh, briefly and then take one final round, um, and we'll go in the original order, uh, starting with Lord Tuivacano. And if you could concentrate on those questions you consider to be um, very specifically relevant to you, um, such as uh, for Tonga, um, the issue of politics uh, heading towards Paris and, and uh, whether there are alliances forming and, and other solutions on a global scale. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, <clears throat> one of the things now that we are discussing within the Pacific is regionalism. Regionalism is, is becoming very important because as smaller island states, we found that we cannot just go alone and do things on our own. We have to come as, uh, as one um, and work together. Because one of the things that we, we find that in most um, Pacific, um, one of the things is that you need um, uh, the political will with the leaders themselves, but of course uh, you must understand we have a problem in the Pacific. The leaders come in like yo-yo, in and out, so we don't have that stability politically. And I think this is one of the things that we in the Pacific has to solve. Because if you don't have that, then we, we still have a problem because Leaders come in with different ideas, with different policies, and <clears throat> so it is very important. That, but I think for us in the Pacific, we have to, to look at that very seriously. Um, so if we do come to Paris, we should have some sort of solution in order to present. Um, but this is one of the things that we also face in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coleman. And if you could also speak to the issue of intelligence sharing as a member of Five Eyes and also um, active generally within the area, that would be excellent. Well, I mean, what, what are the lessons from MH370? Uh, look, in the end, the sharing of intelligence is built on trust, and it's a long-term thing. So I think there's a long build-up over a sustained period uh, before nations are willing to take those security settings to a, a greater uh, and more intimate uh, depth. I think the lessons around MH370 are yet probably to be properly analysed and written. Obviously there will be a series of uh, lessons for the aviation community. But in terms of around international cooperation, as we've heard uh, today, um, well actually the majority of people here may not have heard it because it was within the Minister's uh, lunch, but you know, you had quite remarkable cooperation. I mean, the Vietnamese consenting for Chinese ships to come and search within their territorial waters in the early stages of the search. Um, cooperation that uh, crossed uh, various boundaries um, as all the focus came onto the search. So those are really my comments around uh, intel sharing, but I'd also pick up on your point about uh, water security and uh, China, New Zealand and the Cook Islands have actually been engaged on a water reticulation uh, project in the Cook Islands and I think that's a good model for the sort of cooperation uh, which we need to foster across the region. And once again, you know, trust and cooperation and uh, going deeper into things like intel sharing. In the end, it's the summation of a whole range of activities over a long period. You just can't turn on that trust immediately. Um, and as I say, said in my opening remarks, it all comes back to engagement, getting to know each other, uh, getting to feel comfortable. And actually, these personal relationships, whether at the pole pole or mill mill level, and our people in the military sense, getting to operate together, it all does count for a lot in the long term. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rizvi. No question. Okay. Professor Quillop, do you have anything to... Just uh, one point on the uh, 
platform for assessing uh, the security implications of uh, HADR or climate change. If we're talking for a unified singular platform, uh, to my knowledge, uh, we're still in the works uh, for that. But uh, m uh, the, the truth of the matter is there are a lot of uh, platforms uh, available out there for discussing and assessing uh, climate change implications. And my per own personal worry is that uh, HADR and climate change have actually become a sort of an, a, a fad both for academics and for uh, government uh, bodies so much so that it's a, a regular part of the menu, so to speak. Perhaps the solution is to have a IISS event that would act as a regional platform. And if any of the governments represented here would like to fund that, then we would be happy to talk to you at any point. Um, we'll take the final round of questions now. Uh, we'll go with from the European Union, Antonio Mastrolli. Yes, I just wanted to make a quick point on, uh, in particular, humanitarian aid disaster response rather than climate change per se. This is one area in which the European Union has been quite active in, in supporting joint efforts also in this part of the world. I mean, the ASEAN Crisis Room Center was inaugurated not long ago with uh, important support, uh, technical and financial, from the European Union. And all the recent events, including the, the, the typhoon in the Philippines, has, have seen the European Union actively participating in that. Uh, this is a typical case of enlightened self-interest, not just, I mean, it is in everybody's interest to, to uh, reinforce capacities at this level uh, in order also to increase uh, interoperability. And I remember that it all started with the tsunami in, in Southeast Asia in 2004, and that involved also uh, displaced persons, European and American citizens who were in the region. Therefore, it is something that is more global in nature than people tend to assume. And that is why, to some extent, the extra effort to that, uh, to that end uh, should be made. Now, interoperability is very often seen also as an issue of sovereignty or, or, the, or building trust. It certainly is also part of that game, but there is sometimes also a more menial aspect that is related to technology, hmm, standard operating procedures, and so on and so forth. One key factor here, for instance, is early warning. In order to be able to have a sort of systematic early warning system that is capable of operating across borders, it is also necessary to have technologies and shared procedures to the same. This is not infringing national sovereignty in many cases, especially when it comes to natural disasters. And I think it is something that is worth uh, uh, considering in the future. Uh, let's also consider that, for instance, epidemics are also part of this, and epidemics know no frontiers, no borders, and therefore it is quite important also to be able to build up a global capacity to this end, uh, and that is, I would say, as compared to other issues that are discussed at this conference, a low-hanging fruit. Thank you. Isabel Hilton. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to go back to water security also. Um, what I, I wondered if... if um, the panel saw at all within the existing security discussions any possibility of advancing the rather currently dismal um, situation in terms of managing increasing risk in areas of transboundary rivers. We have a region of no source to sink river agreements, um, a prevalence of beggar my neighbor policies, uh, policy conflict between dam building on the upper reaches of transboundary rivers with, uh, with no forum for discussing impacts on uh, low-lying deltas in the, in the same river systems, and an over-securitized approach to data sharing uh, and management. Um, and given the rather low possibility at present of, uh, of effective mitigation, uh, it would seem to me that this is a security challenge which the region is failing to address. And I wondered if there were any ideas in, in the current security discussion to, uh, to addressing that. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if I might abuse my position as chair very briefly and add my own question that's been lingering in my head throughout this discussion. Um, Mr. Yoshizaki brought up the issue of sovereignty uh, previously in legal arrangements and the difficulties in marrying the two. Um, I wonder whether the panelists have any view on uh, whether differing interpretations of international law, in particular the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, hinder HADR efforts um, in any sense or uh, any form of military collaboration in HADR efforts, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what militaries are able to do in the exclusive economic zones of other countries. Um, and this is relevant both in terms of those that may wish to operate in the EZs of other countries, such as uh, New Zealand, but also those countries that may have uh, reservations about other countries in their EEZs, such as uh, Bangladesh or even Tonga. 
Um, so we have uh, three questions there um, on interoperability, um, water security and transboundary rivers and uh, differing legal interpretations. I will ask the panelists to give two or three minutes answering your questions and any final comments I would like to make on the issues of climate change and HADR. And we will once again go in the order uh, of the agenda. So we will start with Lord Tuivacano. Yes, with the international law, and I think it's up to, uh, I know for instance, with our country, of course we, we go along with the international maritime uh, uh, organization. We have that laws. And of course, with the Pacific itself, um, you cannot define certain area because it's overlapping in the Pacific. It's a big uh, area, oceans. And sometimes it's very hard to, uh, to do that. So what we normally do, we have traditional uh, ties, for example, just take Fiji itself, because we have uh, uh, not only culture, but also family ties. So we do have to have compromises, even with um, uh, New Zealand, uh, Samoan, we are, we are looking at our, our waters, because uh, <clears throat> that is a, a, big, a big issue within the um, uh, we've now, of course, a lot of um, seabed mining and other things is happening in our areas. So, but I think it's it's up to the how your um, relationship with the country that you are dealing with. It is very important. Um, <clears throat> so, coming in here to Shangri-La dialogue, this is also one of the things that helps to to pursue that relationships. Uh, so there are also um, history, historical um, um, boundaries. For instance, we, our, uh, we have a historical boundaries that goes back to the 1800s. So from that you can take 200. But at the same time, there are the questions from our neighboring uh, islands. So, and I think with the international um, um, laws in that, um, we have to respect that. But also at the same time, um, to the International Maritime um, Organization where the, they deal with it in the UN. Um, so and I think that's probably one of the things. With the uh, water security, just, I'm just saying this, one of the uh, group islands in the middle, of course, there's no water, and the only thing is, is uh, desalination. Maybe if, I don't know if any countries would like to help, but it's, um, the only mean of getting water is uh, rainwater or otherwise desalinate. Uh, what is so, uh, it's quite a problem with those many islands. Thank you. Just in practical terms, look, I'm not sure to what extent uh, differing interpretations of international law really are a factor in hindering the response to uh, humanitarian disasters because I can tell you as a politician how it works when there's a disaster in the region. Our diplomats in the relevant country. Uh, will go and speak to their contacts in the local government. So, for instance, in the Philippines government, uh, in the case of uh, Typhoon Haiyan, and say, well, look, would you like some help? And they would say, well, look, this is what we really need. Can you send it? And, you know, if it's within our ability to send it, we will do it. So, um, to be honest, I think discussions around international law in this context may be more of an academic discussion, but practically when disasters occur, countries need help. Uh, those who can make assets available and offer help, and sometimes those offers are taken up, and uh, you know sometimes they're not. I mean, uh, there can be nothing worse than uh, people saying they want to deliver, you know, plane loads and plane loads of uh, old jeans and shoes from New Zealand, when actually what you need is uh, tents, clean water, uh, a desalination uh, rig and uh, medics. So, you know, at a practical level, I'm not sure it is an issue. Look, this issue of, um, and it's the sticky one there, tran transboundary rivers, uh, to be honest, I've got to be honest with you, I, I would need to get some information on that issue because uh, it's not one I've considered. But uh, the gentleman from the EU talking about enlightened self-interest, I think that actually goes to the heart of it, really, and this is the problem in the international response to climate change. In the end, unfortunately, governments tend to act in their own broader interests. And so it's a matter of uh, 
broadening the picture for governments to realise it is in their own interest to take preventative action in this field. And, and that is the real challenge, because there will always be domestic and economic uh, pressures under which any government of any hue anywhere in the world operates. Thank you. Dr. Rizvi, and in particular on transboundary water issues. <coughs> yes. Uh, water is becoming a very, very serious uh, issue in uh, South Asia. And in the case of Bangladesh, we have 57 rivers, 54 of which are transboundary and come from down from uh, India. And so our dependence on uh, water sharing in, is it's, it's a really, literally, life and death uh, a question. Uh, at some level, we have been quite successful. Uh, India and Bangladesh, after years of negotiation, uh, have uh, reached an agreement on uh, on, on the Ganges uh, water sharing, and that was done in 1996. Uh, it is working uh, quite well, and although little complaints from either side, but essentially it is working. More recently, we have again uh, arrived at an agreement on uh, Tista ri River, uh, although it's, uh, it, the agreement has been initialed by the two sides, but not actually signed. Uh, what we have learned that uh, given the fact that we have 54 transboundary uh, 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 river, that going river by river is not a useful way of uh, doing things. So in 2010, we agreed to deal uh, uh, with the rivers, uh, uh, basin-wide uh, handling of the uh, waters. Uh, although we haven't made much progress, but that seems to be the one. And the other two areas where uh, co uh, interesting cooperation is taking place is much of the dispute arises because uh, we do not have enough data or data that is acceptable to both sides. So what we are doing now is more and more of joint uh, data collection, uh, which has, uh, well, it, it is useful in itself, but it is all, even more important because it helps to inform the public so that their expectation of how much water there is to be shared uh, uh, is helped. And finally, uh, we have now also moving more towards uh, not only water sharing, but about how to augment the water uh, resources. So this is a very uh, creative area of work, which is just beginning. And finally, not only we talk about water usage, uh, uh, sorry, water sharing or quantity of water, but how water should be used, what crops uh, we should grow, uh, how we can avoid uh, water intensive cropping, how we can sh uh, part, uh, share agricultural research where we can uh, share with each other uh, crops that require, or we, uh, rice and wheat that requires uh, less water. So all in a very wide area, or centered on water, cooperation between India and Bangladesh has started. Thank you, and finally, Professor Kulop. Just uh, one point to emphasize, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would follow on uh, Mr. Coleman's uh, point of view that uh, yeah, indeed in times of disaster, I mean, uh, these uh, international uh, legal requirements uh, some, uh, a lot of times would, uh, would be uh, not factored in. What I was referring to when I was talking of uh, uh, legal requirements are the individual national uh, legislative requirements of certain countries which need to be uh, uh, put aside in the meantime that we are addressing uh, disaster response. Thank you, and uh, thank you to all of the panelists. Um, we are, have just one minute left here, so this has been a Chipman-esque um, uh, timekeeping episode, and my thanks to all the panelists for that and their, their curt responses. I think there's been very broad agreement amongst uh, everyone here, perhaps unsurprisingly, about the importance of climate change um, and uh, responses to it. The difficulty, as ever, in climate change is moving from that international agreement to international action uh, to allow for that preparedness and response to be uh, ready. 
Uh, I think if there's one key takeaway message from this session, um, it would be to paraphrase, paraphrase Secretary of Defense Hegel from this morning, um, that climate change is not a vision or a dream, it is in fact reality, uh, much as the rebalance to Asia is currently a reality. And it's just uh, persuading all countries, developed and developing, uh, of that reality and the need to respond to it now, uh, not just in some distant future.